So the final thing for today is um, the day outcome presentation from um, Abel. Okay, this is more of a summary of the things we've seen today. Uh, the idea is that uh, we refresh in our minds the key ideas of the day, and is more uh, of a conversation as well. So please feel free to interrupt me and correct me or complement what I'm saying as I go through the presentations. So in our third day, we have uh, uh, three sessions, right? And uh, in our first session, we start discussing smart legal contracts with uh, Nile and uh, and uh, and we understand and DAOs as well and the many projects he's working on and we started to understand that um, they are coming they are here to stay they don't necessarily need to be on the blockchain smart contracts can be doing what they do outside the blockchain so when are we considering using blockchain with smart contracts, it, it, blockchain is not a premise, so we need to think carefully about uh, the implementation of blockchain and if it makes sense at all, right? Uh, we need uh, lawyers to start to code. Uh, and this is something that uh, we've uh, seen in the uh, architecture profession. So I remember when I was doing my bachelor in architecture, I started my first year using rotring pens, ink pens, and rulers, and tracing paper. And in my final year, I was doing everything in a CAD system. And uh, I think nowadays, except if you are commissioned to do a hand drawing, an architect will never hand draw anything. They will only hand draw something out of pleasure, because it's a pleasurable activity, but it's not a professional requirement. And if anything, drawings are no longer just to the drawings. We're moving really towards um, uh, 3D object-driven process, and uh, they're always scripted. So pretty much every single architect today coming out from the Bartlett at least, they know how to code in Python, they write their own code blocks, they parameterize geometry, they know how to develop a genetic algorithm or shape grammar to optimize design, and it is it's baseline nowadays. And I believe we will see the same happening uh, in the law profession as well. Oracles are changing with the various methods and, uh, and extractions processes. Uh, this is something I should know more about because I think oracles are quite fundamental to what blockchains uh, promise. Uh, there are new, new considerations we have to have in terms of uh, CAPEX and how this is informing OPEX. Uh, so there are things that are very much in the domain of OPEX, but uh, they have, with the advent of smart contracts, DAOs and blockchains, uh, we need to consider them in CAPEX. The emergency of a parametric insurance, this is quite key, with uh, the advent of uh, blockchain smart contracts and the more reliable data sources, parametric insurance is becoming a reality but there is no easy foolproof way uh, to guarantee compliance at this moment in time. So uh, smart legal contracts don't need to be perfect. It's more about uh, the audit trail. Uh, and uh, even though we don't have this finalized perfect smart contract uh, that will solve all of our problems, it's worth to have a go because we will have that audit trail. Incentives can go well. Uh, uh, can go well with uh, um, behind the project, so we, we can uh, not necessarily have the right incentives to use smart contracts, but having that audit trail is fundamental, and, uh, and uh, incentives can go also well beyond the project itself, and uh, uh, they are considering uh, wider contexts, like for example, carbon trading, uh, you know, uh, penalties that are paid towards uh, different communities outside the project, like charities or, dare to say, things like planning gain uh, that could be wired into the uh, project development process. Uh, they, uh, the LTs can also be very cheap and low energy. So, the, of course, Bitcoin is energy intensive, but to say that blockchain and DLT is energy intensive is a fallacy. Um, what else do I have here? 
So we need to um, uh, understand that uh, processes, they need to be clarified and that they need more often than not be templated. Uh, and this is something that I think Zulin proposed as well, using BPMN uh, to template processes. Uh, we need to think more about uh, this triology of uh, data oracles and smart legal contracts. There are many um, use cases out there that uh, we should be looking to. Uh, there is also this opportunity to use natural language processing and uh, language models to develop smart legal contracts. Some more uh, research on this area is coming up from UCL and Adobe. And uh, I also noted here that uh, it would be very interesting if uh, some members of uh, the CBC uh, start to uh, strengthen our relationship with the Accord project, for example. Yeah, for example, Gavin would be uh, definitely talking with uh, the Accord project members in New or the Accord project manager, one of them, I think the French guy, I don't remember. Him. Oh, he's gone, all right then. Yeah, so the guys in New York, you should definitely be talking to them because I, I think they are uh, creating something really powerful, which is this um, um, interface with uh, tools that lawyers are uh, prepared to use, like a Word, Microsoft Word and so forth. And then we had Momita's presentation. That was also very interesting. Uh, we discussed uh, building assets uh, security and uh, how they have to change. Uh, we understand that there is a paradox of uh, having no data silos, but this creates problems with uh, cyber security, cyber risk, and we need to think about that. Cyber security strategies for BIM will have to change with the advent of blockchain. It's not simply because we're using blockchain that everything is going to be more secure, if anything, lots of things might become less secure and we need to be thinking about that. Um, BIM submissions now have to consider co-dependencies uh, of federated models. So those co-dependencies, co if they are traced, uh, it will be a very powerful thing for various, various parts of the construction project, not only the delivery of the design, but the, the management of the asset later on. Uh, and I, I was thinking if I should ask Momita, but I know she knows the answer, and I think she knows that I know the answer as well, that uh, with the advent of um, federated uh, models and the tracing the core dependencies, we probably can eliminate the data drop uh, process in BIM. We probably wouldn't need the data drop as it is today, which is in the end of a particular phase, you have a copy of the model stored offline, and probably this would become unnecessary. Uh, but this is something that, uh, you know, uh, we need to look into the detail to see if it's possible. Then we had the Ning Huan presentation, a very interesting high level presentation, talking about construction industry uh, challenges and the shortage of labor, shortage of labor uh, in China and uh, the fact that on-site supply chains can be improved and are part of the solution. And uh, process models should be, uh, I will say here should be, but uh, I think she was saying they are, the ones that she's developing, they are what you see is what you get type of uh, process models and they run in real time. I, I would like to see some evidence for that. Uh, and then we step into uh, Tom's presentation and on his startup, he is creating a marketplace. Uh, and this marketplace, uh, as he described, uh, tries to spot the real value of uh, architectural practice and other design practices. And uh, this could have a very disruptive effect on business to business models. And uh, I think uh, there was a very interesting point on this possibility of agile configuration management if you use that type of platform. So when we're talking about um, projects and they say, okay, you know, there is a design change and this needs to be fed back into the beam because uh, there is some, something on site that we didn't know and now we know and we need to change the design and so forth. All that adaptation uh, of the design needs to be very carefully managed. And of course, when we scale up and you have like a, you're designing, I don't know, a national infrastructure or a city, that configuration management and change engineering is incredibly important and it needs to be agile. So if you're talking about uh, change management 
on the job and you want to do it waterfall, it can be very problematic. It probably needs to adopt uh, an agile uh, framework, an agile approach. And uh, if people say waterfall will solve the problem, I would challenge that. And I would like to see it happening as you have very tight lead lines. Like for example, we need to put the concrete in the foundation this afternoon, you know? So uh, it needs to be agile. Then we had a Philip pres Philip's presentation. And this was very much a cross domain application from the game production industry to the construction industry. I think uh, he highlighted lots of key points there that uh, he is developing it with Nile and it could be used by the construction industry. I think there are lots of commonality. There is very, there is a lot of common ground. I do have questions uh, about the scalability and uh, the uh, references of time in the game development industry and how this can be uh, uh, used or, 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 or just translated into the construction industry. I don't think it's quite the same. Uh, we have very big differences there, like I mentioned before, for example, configuration management over 10 years, 20 years, and so forth. It's something we would have to think about. But uh, as a baseline, there is a, a very big ground of commonality between game production. I design games myself. I've designed three games, and I released in the Apple, Apple a game platform and, and, and so forth. It's something I, I love. Uh, I don't play games, but I like to design them. Uh, and or I, sometimes I play games as well. I just finish one uh, because they take forever nowadays. Uh, but I think there is a, a very clear uh, a traceability between the two processes and we should investigate that. In particular, intellectual property protection. I think it's a very valid point. Uh, I think the, the um, recognition of AI generated content is also not another very strong point. And, uh, and I'm proposing these three models of tokenized uh, uh, um, processes the, the, or tokenized uh, elements in the, in, the, in the process and the solution he's proposing, the rights, the money, and the, the distribution of assets. I think this is very interesting. I think it, it is very fruitful, potentially very, very fruitful in many levels, not just the low hanging fruit, but also the high hanging fruit as well. Uh, the fact that uh, Philip is looking to ISO requirements uh, and, uh, and how they can be addressed in what he's developing is fundamental. And uh, one thing that he said, but one thing that was mentioned throughout the day is the fact that metadata uh, standardization is absolutely key. So how we standardize metadata to be used across many different blockchains and other solutions we are developing and, and other technologies we want to integrate with blockchain is absolutely key. And therefore, we should be thinking, thinking how to uh, extend ontologies uh, about uh, descriptions of the built environment and how we embed that metadata and how this is transferable to the many uh, solutions we want to create and the different blockchains. So in essence, we should have a, a universal glossary for this knowledge domain. And that's my summary for today. And the last thing I want to say is come to Hong Kong. We had a fantastic presentation from Professor Jack Chen, very motivating, and I already miss Hong Kong. Uh, it's one of my favorite cities in the world. And uh, you can come over and, uh, and meet us uh, in flash, face to face, or attend online. And uh, we will have, I believe, a very packed agenda because we already submit, received quite a lot of submissions. We want to get more submissions because we do have an ambition to publish a book based on the proceedings of the conference. Uh, and uh, I think this will be very uh, fresh and relevant knowledge. And if you come over, you have this firsthand. So with that, I thank you very much for coming to the workshop. I, I hope you learned something and I hope to see you soon again. Thank you.